SoFi's official financial statement has just been released, which allows us to see all of the juicy numbers from our Q4 of 2022. Now, the more data that we have, the better. And there was some amazing numbers here, but it doesn't mean that there weren't some pretty obvious red flags in these numbers as well. So in this video, I wanna cover the financial statement or the 10K, along with a bunch of other SoFi related news that I just haven't been able to get around to. Okay, jumping right into it with the financial statement. Now, some of these numbers we've already seen, but a lot of these numbers are also new as well. Let me just start with some of these already. So net losses, as you can see, and also this graph here that's actually showing the net difference between you know the net revenue and the net losses is that we're actually starting to get closer and closer to profitability, which would be at that 100% mark. Very, very exciting to see that. Some of the two main you know biggest expenses that are actually leading us into a net loss is our stock-based compensation and depreciation and amortization. Obviously, we're actually starting to get this, you know, SBC under control. It's actually starting to drop quite significantly over the last couple of quarters. But obviously, our depreciation and everything is still climbing. We have more headcount, which means more leases for new properties, everything like this. So obviously, we are going to be depreciating a little bit. But that's perfectly okay, because the adjusted EBITDA, which kind of cuts out those non-cash expenses, is still rising dramatically. So as we get those things under control, this is actually maybe the better line to actually look at to see how profitable our individual products are actually being right now. And then obviously, underneath that, that growth rate of the EBITDA, uh, which shows you very well how the actual products are actually growing. Customer acquisition costs. Now, this is very intriguing, but also a pretty big, large red flag. Back, you know, even from 2020 or 2021, the actual customer acquisition costs was like not nearly as big as what it has been the last couple of quarters at over $300 and almost $50 per person. This factors in all the people that are getting personal loans, which absolutely could pay for that in the lifetime value of the client. But then also it could be just someone that's actually just joining for the SoFi Relay product. That even still is factoring in this large customer acquisition cost, which still staying pretty elevated. But let me jump into the individual products, which be, you know, SoFi student loans, home loans, and personal loans. Starting with these two kind of, you know, dying products of ours, just student loans having such a problem with the pause right now. However, that's going through the arguments right now in, uh, you know, the Supreme Court. And also our home loans that we've just completely lost our partnership through. Look at the origination volumes from, you know, two years ago, like 2020 or 2021, you know, 670 million, 650 million, all the way to today. And the past three quarters, 330 216, 105. If the trend continues, we'll be at zero by next quarter. Um, so home loans are practically an absolute dead product. And even our student loans, as you can tell, just the originations are just not doing nearly what they used to even a year ago, right? 1.4 billion down to, you know, 400 million. But a really good sign, though, in the past couple of quarters, we were actually, you know, refinancing for 4%, then 4.2%. Now this is actually starting to rise again, 4.74%, okay? Which means that our actual, you know, interest income that is being recognized because we're holding those loans is actually starting to skyrocket, climbing really, really fast. And whenever we look at the sale of loans, I swear, guys, this is actually zero, okay? We are not selling any loans from our actual, you know, student loan book. So uh, it's absolutely crazy. Absolutely zero. Average loan balance, however, this is obviously still dropping because we're not seeing a lot of new gains to our loans, but people are still paying off those principles. So that's going to continue to just drop off. You can kind of see right here in this line right there. The potential interest is a line that I like to create that actually takes in, you know, the average loan balances, how much we're actually making on our interest and how, you know, how many loans we're actually holding. So you can tell that that has been climbing quarter over quarter over quarter, which means for even if we do actually choose to sell these loans or hold them on our books, we can actually get more for our money because the loans are performing better overall. Now onto our home loans, one quick thing, and I mean, we've already spoken about this, but just interestingly enough, that the interest rate earned has actually dropped quite significantly quarter over quarter. It's also, you know, very select clients that were actually taking only, you know, $100 million worth of originations, which is practically nothing, especially whenever you're looking at home loans. And so with that, we're also seeing the potential interest also starting to drop off as well. So, you know, that's definitely hurting the business. But that's not what you guys probably even came to see. You wanted to see the personal loans, okay? And this is where our business is really lying whenever it comes to our lending products. And then our lending products make up about 70% of our overall business. So this is pretty much, you know, the category that we want to focus on. Origination volumes actually went down quarter over quarter, but still extremely high at $2.5 billion. And then look at this right here. Interest rate earned, okay, at 12.42%. 
oh my gosh, right? This is still climbing quarter over quarter over quarter. Interest income recognized. Holy, it is just skyrocketing into the moon right now, obviously, because one thing, average loan balances are actually climbing dramatically. And obviously, it's a higher interest rate earned, and we're not selling as much. Look at this sale of loans here. Almost a million, or almost a billion, then another billion, 750,000, 60,000, okay? We're really, really growing our overall loan portfolio, and it shows on our next slide. We'll show that later. But just to finish this all off, by the way, average balance is growing, and potential interest is obviously growing like crazy as well. Okay, and just to sum up this page just really quickly into our financial services side, uh, one, our referrals actually has gone down for the first time ever ever in the business being public, uh, but that's not too much of a problem versus our brokerage side, you know, that is still dropping, but obviously the market has not been extremely strong, but this is completely made up by our interchange fees, which means people are actually tapping the cards. We're taking an interest off that. Very, very exciting. And then this has actually changed. This is a new column. This used to just be enter or enterprise services. Now they've included it to just be calling other. Okay, so I don't know what they're factoring in that's actually changed here, but obviously it's definitely made a large difference in how they actually calculate this slide. Okay, so the total overall has actually dropped from Q3, but not too, too much. It's still, you know, elevated versus other quarters here. And then on to our tech platform, this is where it sort of gets a little bit weird, guys. Our technology services has actually always grown every single quarter since we've been a public company. But the problem is, is that in, you know, Q2 to Q3, we saw just a little bit of a rise, but we were hoping that wasn't going to start a trend. Then in Q4, this is what we didn't see before our financial statement that has actually come out. It's actually dropped, okay? We're actually starting to shrink, and that's a pretty decent shrink overall, you know, quarter over quarter. And, you know, we didn't notice this because of this software licensing, which seems to be a once a year, maybe on the Q4. We don't have the Q4 numbers from 2021. So is Technosys filling the gaps for Galileo's maybe, you know, potential loss in whether it's clients or, or whatever it is. They did say that they lost one large client this quarter. So potentially that could be a big hurt to our revenue this quarter or going forward. I'm not sure we, you know, only time will tell. But also, we didn't see too terrible of a uh, quarter in our payment networks that's also switched to other as well. But it's still, you know, payment, interchange, everything like this. But the technology services, we got to keep an eye on this because for a company that's supposedly growing, you know, 30% year over year and everything along these lines, uh, you don't want to see some quarter over quarter drop offs because that means that the year over year growths are going to come to an end very, very quickly. Next up, I have my next sheet. This is the cost of loan segment. Okay. In this cost of loan segment, we have all sorts of things that we're covering. Once again, it's in the same format as last time. So just starting here at the top, we have all the potential interests for all of the different products that we've been showing off. I've shown you guys this, okay? At the top, we have the total potential interest all added up. So you can see how the loan portfolio in general is doing. So even those student loans, home loans are all, you know, not performing very well. The personal loan segment is filling in those gaps so much that we're still able to rise quarter over quarter over quarter. Warehouse facilities actually saw a decent increase, okay? Meaning that we're actually starting to borrow more to fund those loans and the actual cost to, you know, to get those borrowings on, you know, the warehouse facilities is increasing as well. But that doesn't mean that our actual interest paying deposits are also growing as well, which the percentage at which we actually have to fund those costs of deposits is also, you know, much lower than the growth in warehouse facilities. So what does this mean? Okay, this means that our loan portfolio that some people are saying, oh, well, our delinquencies are raising so much year over year. Yes, yeah, so is our loan portfolio, right? Back in Q4 2021, we had a $6 billion loan portfolio. Today, it's $14 billion. So no wonder delinquencies are rising. Our, the, the overall portfolio that you're even matching it to is dramatically different, right? Uh, more, than, more than double what it was just a year ago. This is because we're a bank and everything like this. This is the, you know, the sale of loans are going down so, so much. And it's because we want that net interest income to actually be uh, recognized if we believe that the delinquencies are low enough where we can make a decent profit. So I totaled it up in terms of warehouse facilities and deposits and the total expenses that we're paying for both of these sources of, of funding. So both the warehouse facilities and interest deposits, that leads us to a massive increase quarter over quarter to how much it was costing us to fund our loans before. But interestingly enough, whenever we actually look at our total loan balance and their loan loss provisions that they're actually guiding for, it actually went down quarter over quarter. This has not been the first time that they've actually, you know, went down quarter over quarter to later than the next quarter. They bump it up dramatically, but still it is a great sign knowing that they, they are seeing some good signs and I'll break that down even further going forward. But 
our CET1 ratios have actually dropped a little bit once again, down to 14.6%. This places us actually a little bit lower than Lending Club now, however, much higher than the legacy banks. As long as it doesn't go below 7%, we're still considered a, a very well capitalized bank in the eyes of, you know, the SEC, the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and everything along these lines. Okay, but now breaking it down into these three products again, there are just a couple things that I wanted to show off. One is our weighted average for all three of these different products, okay? You can see how much we rely uh, on these products overall. So our personal loans actually make up for 66% of the business, home loans make up around 7%, and student loans actually make up nearly 27% of our overall you know, lending portfolios. So it's very important to understand that. And that's why it's important to also understand the interest rates that we actually earn on it. Considering that, you know, 66% of our portfolio practically is the personal loans, having 12.42% of the overall interest rate earned is a massive, massive increase to our business. And look at this, guys. It, I know I wanted to keep this a little bit of a secret, but oh my gosh. On the actual assumed annual default rates that they assume for the loans that they've actually signed, you can see 2020, 4.2%, 4.4, 4.6, 5%. It was rapidly increasing quarter over quarter over quarter. Well, in Q4 2020, that has actually gone back down to 4.4%. So they're actually saying, no, I think we've actually found a really, really good way to lend out to people who can afford these loans at a higher interest rate, okay, at a higher loan balance, and the, low, and the actual default rates are actually dropping. How amazing is that? And that's leading us to see amazing things in our potential interest. And then once we actually factor in everything, okay, guys? So this is the end, I guess, the, the magic sauce, you know, calculator that I sort of put on it is the total net potential interest. Whenever we actually look at this, you can see that it's actually dropped quarter over quarter, which is not good to see because I loved the trend of it going up and up and up. But because of those large increases in our warehouse facilities at 3% or whatever, that we are actually seeing a little bit of a decrease in our total, you know, performance of our loans, but that's okay. Obviously, it's still very highly elevated versus what it was before. It's still able to scale and, and get much, much larger, for example, like, like look at our loan portfolio. We can go from 6 million up to 14 million and have the potential interest stay the same because it's, it's about how we're actually funding it. It's the efficiency at which we're doing it. Okay, that is pretty much the total financial statement in general, right? There are more things that they cover, but those are really the biggest numbers. And the most important things that I find, we covered the actual cost of actually funding our loans, the efficiency at which we're actually finding new people for these loans, the default rates, we're finding everything. This is why I love these financial statements because you can actually see the full health of the business. The problems that I'm having is with Galileo and the technology services business. It's just seeming like, you know what, a lot of the growth is there and it could be there and the actual story is amazing. But until we actually see those numbers, it's just a story. So I wanna really see that now that we're actually becoming an issuing bank for SoFi Bank, that we can actually get this to, out to other clients. Those clients are actually choosing technicists to be their you know, core providers, but the money has to flow in. So that's really what I'm excited to see. But right now, it's just seeming like it's a little bit talk <laughs> versus what the actual numbers that we're truly seeing. But going back to the cost of acquisition real quick, I think that this might actually be a metric that might drop over time, even though we're still seeing great efforts and our actual loan people that we're bringing on are very, very efficient, okay? I still think that that cost is actually going to go down. And this is just because of the actual publicity that SoFi has been seeing. Like for example, how Fast Company placed them as the third most innovative company in personal finance for 2023. Or how about Fortune here, that placed SoFi as the number one digital bank overall for March of 2023, also being seen by millions of people every single month. And now another thing that Amit actually pointed out is that the weekend, and this is supposedly happening today as the time of recording this video, however, it's not out just yet, is that he's releasing an album called Live at SoFi Stadium. That is the name of the album that will be played by hundreds of millions of people. Right now, he's actually the number one artist on Spotify with over 101 million you know, monthly active listeners. So to just have that brand recognition live at SoFi Stadium is sort of like this amazing trope, almost like the way Madison Square Garden was. And that's all in SoFi's name. And you know what, you're actually starting to see some things on Twitter and stuff like this, like, oh my gosh, did you know that SoFi Stadium has a bank account? Like as if that's the way some people see the company is that, you know what, the actual stadium is so glorious and so, you know, synonymous with large events that people actually go, wow, this 
you know, Stadium has a bank account rather than the other way around or even, you know, just the naming rights for one. Or let's not even forget about the Dazzling Dozen, okay? This was a thing that SoFi pointed out whenever we're looking at Go Banking rates or even Nerd Wallet or, for example, Money.com or Motley Fool Awards where they all have placed SoFi as some of the best, you know, checking and savings accounts. And if we're actually diving into Nerd Wallet just a little bit deeper, they also placed it as the best personal loans whenever it comes to, you know, 2023 for all of online personal loans. So very, very exciting. And these are all just free publicity from places that have millions of monthly, you know, uh, readers or, or listeners or anything along these lines. Nerd Wallet in particular, because they are a public company, you saw over 19 million monthly active people going to their website. And this is some of their largest, uh, you know, award shows that they're actually showing is they're banking for all of the year of 2023. And SoFi placed first on that list. I mentioned earlier that SoFi is actually changing their issuing bank. If you'd have no idea what I'm talking about, make sure you guys go check out that video right there. But aside from that, thank you so much for watching and bye for now.